Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, it's nice to be among friends. Uh, I'm never introduced to the seminars these days without going to the list of people who are my students, and it says something about having survived to this point. I'm going to make the point along the way that I consider myself a Tom student, so uh, I'll make that point when it's appropriate. But it's nice to see you and everybody else, and thank you for the chance to speak to you. So um, I'm going to uh, use this talk, this time, to challenge you as faculty and students of a college of public health, an emerging college of public health, because um, it's a unique time, and uh, our society depends on you. I'm going to show you what I need in the course of the next 45 minutes, and then I'll give you 15 minutes to push back and to either take up the holy grail or. Throw it back at me. Either, either is fine, but, but this is a great opportunity. I hope you'll see yourself in it. So, um, schools of public health are in this uncomfortable position right now. As I'm going to argue, um, it's a critical time for the history of health and health policy in the United States. And um, there are lots of comforting things we tell each other. And when you tell those things, people line up and you get lots of money and you, everything goes your way. And if you sort of tell truth to power, you can see what it looks like. So um, I, I don't want you to take up this mantle lightly. I just want you to know that when you, if you decide to take it up, there'll be some consequences. But eventually, I hope the line is in front of the people who come with the unpleasant truth. Let me get started by introducing to you to a big datum problem. <clears throat> I, when I go to places these days and I hear talks, they're all about big data, big data, big data. This is a talk about big data. Right? Those of you who studied Latin, you know the difference. And so this is the uh, plot of for the OECD countries of average health expenditure uh, for, America, for, for each country against uh, time. And you see the light blue uh, picture, the light, light blue line is the United States of America. And we're the highest per capita cost. We're now actually around 11,000. This is a couple years old. Uh, and, uh, and the difference between, we like to say we're an exceptional country. Um, and we are exceptional in this regard. Uh, but the difference between us from being where we are, if we could still be the most expensive, but just like a dollar more than the second most expensive, right? The difference between what we spend now and what we would spend then is a trillion dollars per year. A trillion dollars per year. So um, George Mason University is a great building university within the great state of Virginia. And uh, I looked in your budget is a billion dollars. So let me just think, what would, what, how much money, how much more expensive are we than would we, we would be if we were tied for the first most expensive? Uh, it's a trillion. How big is that? Well, let's see. Two billion. So there's a hundred, that's a hundred billion, right? A hundred George Mason universities per year. And, uh, and here we are, there's the hundred and there's another hundred and another hundred, another hundred, another hundred. Or there they are. There's nine hundred billion dollars, and that's still not enough. We got to do another hundred, right? So, what is a thousand George Mason universities every year? Is the difference between what we spend on healthcare and what we would spend if we were tied for first rather than being first? You know, a trillion dollars is six percent of the American GDP. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yeah, but we're by far the healthiest people in the world, right? We have the best health outcomes because we spend on our money on the thing that's most important, health, right? But that's the light blue line is America on the right there as well. There we are with Turkey, Poland, Australia, Slovakia, Hungary, Latvia, all great places, but they don't spend nearly as much as we do. And we're, I think, 23 out of 28 out of 41 in any dimension. This is this is uh, uh, life expectancy, but if you do life expectancy given you make it to the age of 65, it's basically the same. The point is we're spending a trillion dollars more than anybody else, and our health outcomes are near the middle or towards the bottom 
quartile of the developed world. So that's that's the problem. That's the big data problem. One trillion dollars per year. And if you wait another few years, it'll be 1.2 trillion. So it, and so you might say, well, what, what do we care? You know, I, I gave this talk to a business community last year, and somebody raised their hand and said, oh, but that's think of it as like economic stimulus. 20% of the economy, one in every five dollars, including this school and my school and my hospital, it's one in five dollars that's spent. So to, if it's too expensive, just think of it as economic stimulus. It goes to all the people who need it. And um, you know, if there was a time when we could afford to waste a trillion here or a trillion there, but these days there hasn't been a real income increase. There hasn't been a real dollar increase in salaries for the bottom 80% of Americans for 40 years. Their employers are spending much more money for them than they used to. Where is that money going to? It's going to pay for the health care costs that don't produce. This is the unpleasant truth. It's hard to say this truth like in medical schools because like my own medical school, I think about 10 billion, the medical system is about $10 billion a year. We're 0.3% of the American healthcare system, which means we're 0.3% of the trillion dollars, which is $3 billion a year. That's a lot of money, right? So it's hard to think, how would you address this problem as a school of medicine or as a medical health system? So who's going to address this problem if, it, you, if you accept the fact that it is a major problem. So really what I want to ask you is what can public health people do to make a difference here? In the world? That's what this talks about. And, um, I just want to make one point. This is a, so I, I'm arguing that the difference between what we spend and what the second most expensive country is just a crude estimate of how much we waste. There have been you know, much better studies of how much we waste by going into the bills and you know, and this is one of them. There are many of them out there, uh, but but they list what a, where they also come up with about a billion dollars. And where does the money go? I, I just want you to see that about four hundred billion. And they come up with a trillion. Four hundred billion is for things like failure of care coordination, overtreatment, failure of care delivery, all things that have to do. With how information is used to make a decision within the medical system. The problem is, is that we make decisions every day. Tens of millions are made per day, and the decisions are made to respond to the incentives, which aren't necessarily to do the things that should be done. Who's going to figure out how to solve this problem? It's got to be the colleges and the schools and the public health. Okay. So, um, what can we do to avoid the waste? Now, in order to answer, the rest of my talk is going to address this question. And in order to answer it, we have to, even though we're population people, we have to think about the, where the decision is being made. Right? So I want you to, how many people are clinicians here? I, I want you to be clinicians, and I want the rest of you to pretend you're clinicians, like that you play one on, on, on TV or something. So um, play a, a, a physician's role for a moment. And now I want you to think about what happens when you're being a clinician. Well, what happens is a patient comes to see you or a healthy person comes to see you and you collect some information about that person. And this particular person that's sitting across your desk from you, this 40 year old man has no family history of a particular life threatening disease. Because they turned 40, they got an automatic email from your health system saying you should be screened before your next appointment uh, for this life-threatening disease. They went and got the screening test, and they tested positive for the disease. And then they called up the office and said, what should I do? Well, you know, I'll see you, make an appointment. And it took four weeks to get an appointment. They have young children, a loving spouse, and, uh, and there's a lot of fear in the family around this positive test for this life-threatening disease. What do we have here? We have a decision problem. Actually, we have a question problem, which is this person has had a test. They have certain information about them. 
And what they want to know is, do I have that disease, doctor? Because it's a life-threatening disease. And what should I do about it? You know, those are the kinds of questions. So this is a question about an individual and about an action that's going to be taken for an individual, right? And the physician is informed by data about that person, 40 no family history positive test. Now, what do you do? I'm sitting right across from you, they got that sort of long look. You can see they haven't been sleeping well. What do you do? You're the clinician. What do you do to answer these questions? What you do probably is you remember that you went to medical school, psychology school, whatever clinical school you went to, and you remember this two by two table, something like this. And, and you, in particular, remember this row of that two by two table. This is a table that just shows for people who actually have the disease or not, what the rates of testing positive are on this particular test. So what you do is you take the data for that person and you match that person to a population of otherwise similar people, all around 40, all no family history, all who had a positive test, right? And you then have information about those people. You can see that only 15 out of 1,000 of them actually had the disease. And that fact, that connection of this person's data to a population adds meaning the interpretation of the one person's data, right? It brings meaning to bear. And what you say to the patient is, well, based upon what we know about you, people like you really don't have the disease very often. It's only like about 15 in a thousand, 1.5%. And what does your patient do at that point? And then what, is, what does he do? He says, so you didn't tell me that when I called on the telephone, right? So this is an example of what we have to do in the health system for the millions of decisions that are made every day, tens of millions of decisions that are made every day. We have to take what we know about a person, reference them against a population of otherwise similar people, and use that information to add meaning and to help make the decisions that we make. So I just told you what just happened. We connected the, the individual to a population, we created meaning, and what we did is we really learned in a scientific way the answers to the questions that we did. Now, two by two tables are easy. Unfortunately, the data that clinicians are being exposed to now every day that they use to make decisions look like these data, you know, genomic information, longitudinal measurements on markers, images, and what's the thing in the lower left? Anybody know? I didn't know, so don't feel bad if you didn't know. The chromosomes, exactly. And what's the what's the thing lit up on the end? Telomere, exactly. So telomere lengths now are being used in chronic disease decision making. And the point is the data that's available to help us add meaning to the to the decisions made by any particular person becoming increasingly complex. And so just remembering some table from, from um, medical school, or even not remembering the table, remember, remembering qualitatively that that particular test is a very nonspecific test. You really can't trust it very much to make a decision. You need to do something else. Right? That sort of information isn't available as often now because of the complexity of the data that's emerging. So really what we want to do is we want to be able to reference a patient against the a population in making decisions, even when the data is increasingly complex. But the other thing we want to do is over time, we want to be able to narrow in the group of people that we are comparing this person to, to be ever more like that person. And so I said 40 years old, no family history, positive tests. It would be nice to also say with similar genetic predisposition or a similar diet or other things that are important to this particular disease. And by the way, does anybody recognize those rates that I put up there in that little thing? What disease is that really for? You think about that really. I'm going to answer at the end. Okay, so um, the, the Institute of Medicine calls this trying to become a learning healthcare system. And the idea is that when you have 
doctor and patient sitting across from each other. Is that, is that what it looks like when you go to your doctor? Actually, I saw in the in interview rooms here, it does look something like that. But when I go to my doctor, he sits in a chair facing his computer, and I'm back there on the table, and he sits down and he's typing in epic, right? He's, and then I suddenly hear, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, and I think, oh my, I'm like, I must be really in poor health. He's, he's complaining because he can't get the damn computer to do what it is he wants it to do. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. That's the practice of medicine, and it's generating data. We just looked at some. And what we want to do is we want to take that data, combine it with the evidence about populations of relevant people to create knowledge about the individual. And then to be able to deliver that knowledge back to where the decision is being made. This is the virtuous cycle that we want to be able to create. The Institute of Medicine writes a lot about this, that the health system should become a learning system. And I totally agree with that. But, but actually what we have found at Johns Hopkins is when you try to change the system, it's like flying a um, 777 across the Atlantic Ocean and trying to change one of the engines halfway across. It's, it's hard to do. And really what you need to do is change individual clinics, right? Actually make groups of, of medical decisions more, auto, more, more better informed and then do it across multiple clinics. And then ultimately all the clinics and then you can only do that. You can only scale this process if you bring infrastructure into the health system. What I'm gonna do is show you what we're doing to make this idea of bringing the relevant information to bear on a patient's decision at the moment the patient's making the decision, informing that decision by what we, what we know about populations of otherwise similar people. With me? Okay, now to do that, we have, to, so this is for one, one, one last thing. We have, I'm just, I'm not gonna talk about infrastructure, but what we found out, we started working on infrastructure to do what I'm gonna show you called learning infrastructure. And what turned out is you can't do any of that without these other things. So if the leadership of your institution doesn't believe this is the future of healthcare, doesn't first doesn't believe that there's a problem in healthcare, they don't believe the big data issue, right? because they have a vested interest in not believing it. Perhaps it's hard to change the engine when you're flying the plane. Um, that's why schools of public health are going to be so important to keep raising this issue, raising the opportunity. Right? Um, but, but you have to have leadership make an announcement that says, we're changing. We may not change it while we're flying, but we're going to start building that new engine. We're going to start. You have to get them to see because it, it's too painful otherwise. Right? So we're shifting in Hopkins from being about just doing more of something, to trying to get the best health, health outcomes at more affordable costs. And the state of Maryland is helping us do that. But you also need a new bioethical framework. It turns out for good reasons that we built a brick wall between discovery, between research and clinical care. And we have rules that prevent them from being together, which is a sort of a way of saying, if you're doing research, the only way to use it in clinical practice is to publish it and have it go out there and circulate for a while and eventually come back and maybe change what happens in your clinic. We can't, we can't wait that long. So you need to change this. And then the thing that really has to change is the people who produce better health outcomes at more affordable costs, the clinics that do, they have to get the money that was saved, some of the money. They can't, because, because they're going to end up doing less of the things that you currently pay them for. If you pay them less, you destroy the system. You have to pay them more for doing less. And so you need this sort of infrastructure. Um, we're working on it, but this is what we've made the most progress on. So that's what I'm going to talk about the next. Let's see how am I doing? Jen, are you going to tell me when I got five more minutes? Okay. I think I'm good. Okay. So that that was all about public health's big opportunity. What I want to charge you with is taking on this problem and within this university become an advocate for changing the state of Virginia system. You're in a unique position because you don't have a big medical business, right? You have a small medical business, just big enough to be able to learn how to do these things and to do them better. And you can then take on uh, the others who are going to be a little bit more resistant. Uh, so that's that's what we've talked about thus far. Now what I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to tell you everything Tom Lewis taught me about Bayes' rule 
and Bayesian hierarchical models. Now, those of you who escaped my class when you were at Hopkins, this is it now. You, you, it's too late, right? You're here and you're going to get it. Right? And then I'm going to show you, this, this, will, this won't be too painful, I hope. Um, this will not be painful at all because I'm not sure how to do this, but this one may be a little bit painful, but I hope not. Who, who considers themselves the least technical person in the room? Raise your hand if you're the least technical person in the room. The least, okay, the least statistical person. You, you really don't like statistics. All right, what's your name? Patrice. Uh, Patrice. Patrice. Sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. Patrice. When we get to that second part, it's you and me. Okay. Forget the rest of it, right? Okay. You let me know if you understand what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. And then I'm going to show you two examples as time permits. And then we'll. Um, this is a primer on learning. This is a model for learning. There are multiple models for learning, but this is the most valuable one. This is the most valuable one <laughs> for medicine. What one thing I have trouble convincing my clients, well, I'm careful what I say. Um, one of the things I, I think is a problem for schools of public health is they, over time, have been beaten down. So they don't think they have a lot of responsibility for 98% of the $3.2 trillion we spend on healthcare. It doesn't go to them, right? So the, the medical systems spend 98% of all the money, right? And the public health community gets 2%. And the public health community has, unlike it is in many other parts of the world, has sort of thought, oh, that's their money, right? We got our money. So most of the problem is with them, right? They're the ones who are wasting the trillion dollars. But I, I say to people in public health, you own that whole thing. All of that is what causes health. Right? And, it, and it causes not only health, but all the things like education and retirement and family leave and all the things that are important for people, not just in their health, but the other things in their lives, it's all being sucked away because it's going into the part where it isn't being used as productive as it needs to be. Okay? So it's your job. Okay, so we're going to talk about how to learn. So I'm going to, I'm going to first start with a, a, a little simple example. So I have a coin here. Actually, the four points here. Okay, so I have a coin. And learning is trying to figure out what's the state of nature. This coin is part of nature. Do you agree? So this coin has a certain number of heads on it. Maybe they have a hypothesis about how many heads are on this coin. One. I'm going to call that H1. Actually, I'm, I want to focus on how many tails on this coin. One. Because if it has one head, it has one tail. H1 is one tail. Okay. Anybody else have a different possibility? The biostat department is John's Hopkins. Jenna? Jenna? Zero tails. Okay, can I call that H0? Okay. Anybody else have any other? Somebody who didn't go to John's Hopkins? <laughs> oh, this is not hard. I, you, 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 you. Two tails. Who said that? Good job. Very good. Two tails. Okay. So well, this is science, right? What we did is we identified some state of nature we'd like to know. And then we hypothesized about what it might be, what the state of nature might be. Zero, one, or two tails. Let me just ask, how many people think this is a zero-tailed coin? Two-headed coin. Raise your hand. All right. There they are. Two. Okay, two, three. Three. Okay, three people think it's a two-headed coin. How many a zero-tailed coin? How many people think it's a one-tailed coin? Okay. How many people think it's a two-tailed coin? Stay with me. You're going good. All right. So most people think it's a one-headed coin. Why do you think that? Well, most coins are. Exactly. Very good. So this is what you believe collectively that it's probably a one-tailed coin. Okay, now what we do in science, by the way, what, what we just did is we identified a target for doing science. We hypothesized about the target. Actually, that's an act of creativity. Right? Remembering things from the past. These are hypotheses. The scientific method is now to do an experiment that favors some of the hypotheses more than others. So I just want you to imagine for a moment 
that I toss this coin three times. That's going to be the experiment. And we're going to get an outcome. And I just want you to imagine what we get are three tails. When we toss it, the first thing you get a tail, second time tails, third time tails, because I don't I'm doing it. Right? It might not work out the way I want, right? Okay. Are you with me? Okay. So now what we do is we're going to look at the probability of observing that data, three tails, in each of the possible states of nature. So if this is a zero-tailed coin, as only one person, hypo uh, two people, or three people hypothesize, right? if it's a zero-tailed coin, what's the probability of getting three tails in a row? Zero, exactly correct. You guys are all wrong. Right, so if it's a fair coin, that is to say a one tail, one head coin, I toss it three times, what's the probability of getting three tails in a row? 12.5%, how'd you get that? That's correct. <laughs> where, where did you go to college? <laughs> You had a cup. Good for CM. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's correct. 12.5%. Now, that's, that's if it's H1 is true, which most of you think it is. So what, what about if it's a two-tailed coin? What's the probability of getting three tails in a row? 100%. Exactly. Now, those three numbers, 0% if it's H0, 12.5% uh, if it's H1, 100% of it's H2, right? In each of the hypotheses, we calculated the probability of the experimental result. And which, which hypothesis made the experiment most likely to have had that result? Two-tailed. So the data support the two-tailed hypothesis eight times as strongly as the one-tailed hypothesis and infinitely more than the zero test. So we ruled out one of the hypotheses. So we've learned. How many people think this is a, it's, how many, well, I'll ask, how many people think it's a zero tailed coin? These, these are all trained statisticians or epidemiologists. How many people think it's a one tailed coin? Raise your hand. How many people think it's a two tailed coin? Raise your hand. Now they all work to see what Tom did and then they <laughs> switch. <laughs> okay, good. But so you you um, don't don't tell them. Just hold that coin, right? Okay. Now you did change your opinion. It went from three for zero, forty for um, one, and one for two, and now it's about zero and uh, maybe thirty and ten, which you learned. Learning. That's that's called Bayes' theorem, and here here it's written out mathematically. So probability it's a two hypothesis two two tails divided by probability it was a one tail. Right? This is this probability just means how did you vote, right? What was your belief? It's called the prior belief because there's no data yet, right? And for you it was I think. Actually, for two tailed, it was one out of 40. So one out of uh, 36. And then what is this? This is the probability of tails, tails, tails if it's two tailed, divided by the probability of tails, tails, tails if it's one tail. Right? What was that number? That number was eight. 100% divided by 12 and a half percent. That number is eight. And what this, this rule says is what you believe after you've seen the data. Probability that it's two tailed given you've seen tails, 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 divided by the probability it's one tail given you've seen tails, tails, tails. This should be equal to what you thought before, one in 36, multiplied by the likelihood of the observation, the likelihood ratio under the two hypotheses, right? And this was eight, and that's 36. So what's 836? Don't tell me. Let me say it was 32, 830 seconds was one quarter. So if, if this was one to 32, and this was eight to one, this is eight to 32, which is one to four, which means a reasonable group 
having seen this experiment would that would say it's about one chance versus four chances, or about a 20% chance with the two tailed coin. I've just shown you the formalism of learning. Now, what I want to do is show you how to use that formalism to change healthcare. That was the first easy example. Any questions or concerns about it? Okay, now we're going to do um, the harder one. Actually, we're not going to do it. We're just going to do this simpler version of it. So, what do you see up there? Oh, the painting or the sketch is called Plato's Cave. How many people are philosophy majors? Went to Siena. You must know a little bit about philosophy. I know you did. I know. <laughs> it's a Jesuit school. Yeah. They slap your wrists with a ruler. That when I was in school, that's what they did. Okay. Um, called Plato's Cave. Well, what do you see? Just call, call out something you see. Beast, beast. Shadows. animals, animals, shadows. People. and shadows. Animals, so they're, they're the actual animals being carried by people, and then there's shadows of animals. Actually, if you look at the animals, there's two animals, and I think it's a Grecian urn behind the two animals, and when they get projected up on the wall, maybe you can see an urn, maybe you can't is a prisoner exactly and he's he's chained to the wall right and can he see the animals in the earth she no right she we only see the projection of reality on the wall of the cave which and the projection is coming from that fire on the left you see it what does this have to do with learning and that, well let me ask the question where's the doctor Where's your clinician? Shadow. Uh, the shadow is, it, it's got to be a person. Oh, sorry. It's the prisoner. The prisoner. So this is your doctor. And what, what is this story telling us? You can't see. We, the, the doctor, when you sit across from the doctor, the doctor had that you were a 40-year-old man with no family history, that you had a positive test. The doctor couldn't see whether you had the disease or not. Right? So the doctor's job is to actually try to in interpret the shadows, be able to tell you what's likely to be your situation, and furthermore, to tell you what treatments to use without perfect information about what the, your state of health is. And why is this the issue of American medicine in particular? Because all the incentives in American medicine are to do, 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 right? To do things. You get paid more if you do things. You get paid less if you don't do things. And in the presence of vague knowledge, right, since we don't know, we might as well do it, right? Worried about. I'm going to give you an example, a couple of concrete examples just a minute. Right? But are you with me? It, and what we find in that trillion dollars of waste, where the waste is greatest is where the, where the most, where the conditions are most vague, like in the chronic disease conditions. It's really hard to, just, to know exactly what the person's disease etiology is, and all we have are various kinds of imprecise symptoms. That's where we waste most of the money. So what we have to do in schools of public health is we have to build the systems that enable us to learn from the evidence and to improve, to reduce the uncertainties and improve the decisions that are made in light of the uncertainty using the kind of method I just illustrated. We're going to skip over. This is going to be my course of statistics, Bayesian hierarchical models. We don't have enough time for it. Oops, sorry. I'll come back and do this in one of your biostatistics. So let me show you what we've done in two disease situations. This is um, the first one I got involved with a few years ago. So our department of urology is famous. I know this because, well, they were famous for doing prostatectomies, removing men's prostates who have, pro who have prostate cancer. Prostate surgery historically leaves about 50% of 
the people who are operated on impotent and or incontinent. So it's, it's not a great, it has bad side effects. And there was a particular surgeon at Johns Hopkins named, named Pat Walsh, who's very famous, because his rates of those side effects were very small. He, uh, he just had, you know, I know, I know this because when I worked in the dean's office. I worked for the equivalent of a Dean Buck many years ago, and he was friendly with this Pat Walsh when he was appointed. And he went to Pat Walsh. He said, will you help support me? He said, yes, I'm going to give you the most valuable thing I can. I'm going to give you one slot in my surgical rotation every year. You can give it to whatever rich person you want. And we raised a lot of money by getting people into Pat Walsh's surgery, rich white men with, with prostate cancer. Anyway, so that's the background. And now um, this same department that made its history on prostatectomy went away about seven years ago and said, we're done with prostatectomy. We take out so many indolent tumors and not, not done doing it, but we, we want to figure out how to not take out indolent tumors. That is tumors which should have been left alone, causing bad side effects in men who would never have been harmed by cancer. It turns out there's about 180,000 new prostate cancers a year in America, and about 40% and about of them are indolent. They should be left alone. The problem is we don't know which 40%, and we don't have great evidence about this. So what do men do when they're told they have prostate cancer? They take their prostate off, because it's a lot better to be incontinent or impotent than it is to be dead, right? So, the, so and, and what are the incentives for the surgeons? They don't get paid for not taking they get paid for taking it out. So we take out a lot of prostates in America. Now what I'm going to show you is the system we built that uses Bayes' theorem to sort of help make better decisions. So this is the data you have to look at if you're a urologist. So what we have in blue are what's called prostate-specific antigen. A level of four means you probably have, you probably have something bad happening. And then the other thing that's shown here is the result of biopsies. So every green triangle is a biopsy. And D down here at six is a particular score. It's actually six or lower versus seven or higher. And being down here means um, we're willing to not take out your prostate at the moment. We'll wait and see. And being up there, most urologists will take it out because it's an indicator of the potential for metastasis. So that's the data for one man. And then remember what I said is you compare the data for the one man that you have against the population of people, right? And we have the same sort of data on 1,500 men at Johns Hopkins. And in 900 of the cases, we actually got their prostates when they got them out. And we actually could figure out what the actual pathology was. And those people had um, tumors that should have been removed. And the others had tumors that should have been left alone. But they, are, they were all taken out. And I have that on all 1,500 men. And uh, it turns out we can just do exactly like we did with the with the two by two table at the beginning. This man has an eight well, eight percent of people like him with respect to all of these different measurements. And we and there are many more measurements I'm not showing you, including recently genetic screening data. Um, he has an eight percent chance of that tuber being aggressive. And so now we put this into Epic, our electronic health record. Shows in is 8%. There's actually five categories. The red and the purple are the bad ones. That's the 8%. And then we, we worked with patients on this, and they told us they wanted to know some other things once they looked at this. And we built up an inter interactive thing for them to be able to look at. Um, and, uh, and we now use this in our urology department. And what I would like to do is I'd like to make it available to all patients who are meeting their urologist to be able to get a better quantitative sense. And as, and as the information improves, we'll be able to improve this prediction. Get these other examples. I'm going to go to the end. Right, lots of stuff, too much stuff. So, um, who is this? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> now, who's this? Uh, it's George Bull. Who is it? Okay. He actually lived before George Bull, and uh, enlightened people like Tom Lewis um, practiced Bayesian statistics 
since his very beginning. Others of us had to come to this later in life. But, um, but what's happening in medical systems now is they tried to create expert systems using Boolean logic. What does Boolean logic mean? Who, who remembers that? From them? If then else, you know, like it's the circuitry stuff, you know, if this, so that's how EPIC works. EPIC says, if your prostate specific antigen is above four, and if you have this, then send a note to somebody, right? Whereas Bayesian is what we just illustrated. It builds probability models and, and gives out, and it can integrate much more complex information and gives out probabilities as many. So this is a transformation that's going on in our institution and in others from Bool to Bayes, right? We're shifting from Bool to Bayes. And if you, um, <laughs> I, I saw in all of your eyes, you were thinking, oh, I'd like some good news for lunch. Um, so uh, we built an information system. We, we basically had our data in Epic. We jailbroke it from Epic. Every night it goes out into the cloud. And we made a space for people like you to work with all the data from a certain subgroup of patients that you want to study and build these kinds of tools. You could work with your medical colleagues and actually build the tools. And then we have a system for putting it back in the electronic health record so that we can actually affect care. We call this PMAP. And we're working with Microsoft to have it be widely available. So um, let's just end by saying um, it's a trillion dollars of waste, right? I just, I, uh, I've only ever worked on one other problem in my life that, where the answer was a trillion. And that was the cost of the smoking epidemic in America. It's a trillion dollars over six years. And uh, here we waste a trillion every year in this problem. A trillion seconds is, ago is 30,000 years before Christ. A trillion hundred dollar bills is 630 miles an hour. It's $9,000 per household in the United States every year. Imagine you can write a check. All we have, the healthcare problem is a problem, but, but the problem that they're not focusing on is not lack of access. That is a problem. It's the reason we have lack of access is because we waste so much money. That's also a picture of a trillion. So uh, let me now offer my challenge to you one more time that um, public health's opportunity is to address this big problem in the public's health, that we waste a trillion dollars in our medical system. We need to capture a big chunk of that money. And the way to do it is to stop making bad decisions, to actually bring the relevant information to bear on each decision so that we do fewer bad ones. I showed you formally an example of how to do that. I gave you one example and uh, told you that we're trying to build some infrastructure to do this. But what I want to leave you with is the notion that if you wait around, for the medical system, it's this problem. It's not, it's, well, it's going to happen later than it needs to. So what I would say is that George Mason University should become the leader of thinking about how to get this kind of reasoning into healthcare practice to solving all the technical problems that exist in doing it in the practice of medicine and in public health decision making, and then to um, become a champion for it. and. Uh, Join the good guys that are lined up behind that uh, that's got you there so far. Thank you very much for your attention. So these, these kinds of, one thing I want to make clear is that what I aspire uh, is, to, is to have the relevant evidence brought to bear to a clinician and patient at the moment when decisions are being made. I don't want to make those decisions. Uh, and when you speak to patients, they don't want to make those decisions by themselves. They want to know what the real 
risks and benefits are likely to be. And so um, I think, you know, this whole big like AI thing, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, it's like I would go as Tom said this one, how about we just go for some real intelligence? So we want to bring intelligence to the decision. And all these models do is they do what clinicians do when the problems are simple. You can actually do it in your head. And they take that same logic and they apply it to situations where the, the evidence is much more complex when they can't do it in the head. And you help them do what they want to do. Well, I, I, I don't know exactly, you know, Optum's thing, but if, I, I, some people think this is like a big brother system. No, this is a system that just orders the information and helps to bring meaning to the transactional data that overwhelms people at the points of decision. So that's, that's what we're shooting for. And I think that, I think everybody, in fact, I know in my experience with working with the clinicians who may or may not understand this, they love this. They love this. Because the first thing we do is, you know, like my doctor who was sitting there, you know why he really gets frustrated? Because he has my most recent cholesterol level, but if he wants to see what it has been over the last 10 years he's been treating for me, you know, he can't get it, you know? He's got to go back and find previous bit and look it up. And I, so what the first thing we just made him a picture of the data, right? So we can now see that first thing. Now we also can sort of put some probabilities around what the meaning of it is, right? So that's what we're really talking about. I also say one other thing, maybe in part of your question was that there are going to be situations where we don't have the right measurements. And so the predictions aren't very good. So the data really doesn't stand up to this kind of model. So, the, so that's probably 90% of that. But you know what happens when you do this? Especially when you do it with the clinicians, that they get to this realization. They see it being done successfully in some of this, and they, and they can't do it themselves. They say, well, how come we can't? So, well, because we don't collect the right data. Well, and then they start worrying about that. And so they start to make this transition from being do what is incented by the financial situation to what is the scientifically optimal thing to do. And they start trying to become scientific about the practice. So that's, that's what we hope. That's a really great question. So let me tell you a quick story. I got into this because 10 or 11 years ago, I was uh, serving a um, administrative role in my university at the time when the university decided to do a big fundraising campaign. They were going to raise $4.5 billion from the public and from their alumni, basically, grateful patients. And, uh, and the, we had a new president, and unlike all the previous uh, campaigns we had done, the president said, we're going to spend 40% of the money we raise to solve four major problems in, in the world. And what were the four that, that we chose? We chose clean water, that's a good one, I thought. Um, the American city, which was about sort of the infrastructure and the poverty, constantly poverty versus global health, which was like developing countries, sort of thing. And then I didn't know what to call it. We ended up calling it in-health. But it was like transforming the practice of medicine to take advantage of genomics and new imaging technology and all those sorts of things, and the new revolution in communication and computing. And that we had a committee of people who were formed to do that in-health when I was given responsibility for chairing that. And that committee, um, all our best people around the table from you know all over the university and the health system and we concluded that we concluded to do this this is what we should do okay now you asked about education so while we're sitting at the table somebody said well what do we teach our medical students uh, and uh there was nobody at the table who like knew the details so we went away and read what their curriculum was and it was called genes to society it's the name of their them and they were very proud of it. They published it and we got the people who had developed it on, on our committee. And it turns out this is what they were teaching the medical students. So they were already teaching at our place, the medical students. And here we are 10 years later and we can't practice medicine 
way we teach the medical students. So the, so the problem isn't that the, 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 we're not teaching the right way, because this is a very logical way to proceed. The problem is it's not how we practice medicine. So what we have to do is we have to bring what we do in alignment with what we think. Yes, we have to have, and now we have specialized courses for clinicians and various things. But 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 I think in in the good universities where they're teaching medical students, I think they understand that. A little bit about some of Right. So, well, that, that true personalization is a total lie. Well, that's the first thing to say. And what 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 is possible is that for certain um, conditions or health issues, we will um, illuminate the, the exact mechanism of the disease. How are we going to do that? We're going to do that through research, much of it which will involve populations of people, but. But but we'll enumerate. We'll, we'll actually illuminate entirely the mechanism. So then, you can think of mechanistic knowledge as being equivalent to the reference population. I think what you're saying is you don't have to be statistical. You can be deterministic in how you use the data you collect on that one person, and, and that will happen. And and that's the promise of you know, omics and so forth. Um, committee and, and so I, I I see that as being an example another example of exactly the same thing except the reference is not against the statistical population it's against an, a knowledge base of the mechanisms of the disease so when you see this you know what it means um, we just go and say go back to that committee when we had the issue with the education we had on that committee uh, a guy uh, a guy who's the best you know, genomics person in our university, and somebody asked him during the course of uh, one of the early meetings, let me ask you a question. If we focus all this money on genomics, right, or called genomic medicine, which is what people mean when they say personalized medicine, right, or even what they mean when they say precision medicine, right, genomics, um, we ask this genomics person, what, what fraction of the medical expenditures will be significantly changed by the access to genomic information about every person in the next 50, in the next 30 years is the question. And he said one or two percent, two percent. And so we've, we've studied this a little bit. I think it's fair to say that genomics will have minimal impact on the $3.2 trillion we spend. In fact, what it's likely to do is to make that, three, it's the next invention that's gonna make that 3.2. Go through the road. Right? So I'm not against genomic medicine. I'm all in favor of it, particularly if I have the disease and they know the mechanism, I'm delighted about it and they know how to treat me. That's that's the holy grail. But while we're trying to get there, the best way to get ready is to start behaving rationally with respect to the measurement we get. Yes. If it's uh, Bayesian statistical model, then it's Boolean to Bayesian. We've gone through that healthcare became all of them. So, you know, driverless cars, you know, when you hear about machine learning, artificial intelligence, these sorts of techniques, they're not exactly this, this this makes more sense in medicine, but it but but the methodology of referencing the particular situation this car is going through right now. To a, it's not a database, it's, it's what's derived from a database that's allowed the engineering to know what to do at that moment. That's exactly the same learning technology that I'm describing. So, yes, it's being done in, in, in business analytics, so called business analytics. All, all of this, most industries do this. It's only education and medicine that haven't gotten uh, so far along. Maybe I'll add So one more question here, yes. <laughs> yes. 
So that, so that's, but no, but, but, that, but what happened, so that's exactly the important point. When you say to a patient, it's 8% chance of being aggressive. And the patient says to you, and I, should I take it out now or can I wait six months? And the whole idea of active surveillance is not to say, oh, well, let's just roll the dice. And what the evidence shows is that if you wait six months, you don't, you, it doesn't cost you anything because your tumor is, all, even if it's ultimately going to be aggressive, is growing slowly enough that in six months, you'll be able to have the same positive outcome as you have if you take it out today in, in terms of forestalling uh, metastatic so we we don't we want to keep it's not just one question it's a whole series of questions and we have to get good at answering them. Yeah. So let's just close with um, the state of nature. You tell them I don't I know what it is. What do you mean it's a rigged court? How many <laughs> how, how many tails does it have? Two tails, right? So those of you who, who voted for two tails, I knew you would vote for two tails. You didn't even need that lecture ahead. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, including.